Somebody say the Holy God. The Holy God. Have you ever thought about God's holiness? What is that's you know Ryan kind of talked about that. Uh, the word. I thought he was going to preach my message. I'm like whoa 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 whoa. <laughs> the Holy God. Holy that, that word holiness and holy. You know that just seems. I mean most of us know that that's something about God, and it just seems so far removed from where we are, from where we live, from our mess. But holiness simply means set apart. That it is set apart. That it is different than anything else. It is a one of a kind. And so what I want to share with you today is some some scriptures I found and some, some principles I found in the Bible. That if we will dare to set our lives apart from the world, we will see that part of God that is set apart for us there are there are giftings callings visions mysteries that God has for you that you will never see until you're willing to set yourself apart so you ready to get started let's bow our heads and pray Lord thank you for today I pray God that you give us vision or give us true vision of who we are give us microscopic vision give us spiritual eyes to see our hearts Lord, give us the the reality of of who you've called us to be, where we should be, and the truth of where we actually are. Lord, I thank you so much that you are a holy God, that you have been set apart, that you are not like us. Oh God, I am so thankful for that. Lord, I thank you, God, that your ways aren't like my ways, that your thoughts aren't like my thoughts. God, but I pray that you show me where I can change, that I can see more of you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I think it's in 1 John. I didn't look this up, uh, but there's a scripture that refers to it. It says, when we see him, we will know him. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. I talked to you about you become what you behold. The thing that you look at, you will, some of you know that's to be true. You're like, I can just look at food and I gain weight. Right? (laughs) Right? Yeah. The thing that you look at, my kids had a video game years ago. We had a great big you know theater room and we had and we we'd, sometimes we'd play video games on this huge screen I mean, it was like nine foot diagonal screen it was just massive and uh and there was a game they had i don't know what it was called but it was a driving game and the, the point of this game was you ran into other cars it's like whoa this is my kind of thing right here man i know some of y'all y'all guys just want to run into people on the road you're like get out of my way i'm going to hit you anyway but uh, so this game was you you would you'd, you'd you'd get points for like running people off the road and stuff. And uh, man, I thought it was the coolest thing. And I'd play that for you know an hour or two, and then then you know got to go to Walmart. Woo! It's like, wait a minute, I'm not really supposed to run into people because I I, I mean in just in just a few minutes of watching that game, I had it, it started to alter the way I looked at things. It started to alter my driving ability. I honestly quit playing the game because I was afraid I was going to run into somebody on purpose. Not because I was mad, because it's just like, whoo, you know. It just, I mean, it's ridiculous. We become what we behold. If you're hanging around a bunch of sad, sappy people, show me your friends, I'll show you who you are, right? If you're hanging around drug addicts, you're going to become just what you're looking at, right? That's the way it works. We become what we behold. And so the truth of the matter is, and, and that's, that's not a bad thing. It's just you got to put it in the right context. Because if we behold him, guess what? We begin to look like him. What an amazing testimony of somebody that, that we, we, you look at them and you say, man, what you did right there was just like Jesus. I thought that was Jesus right there when you was, you know, feeding those people, when you was doing this, when, when you had that compassion for them. And, and the only way that happens is when you begin to look like, look at him because you, be, you, be, you become, I'll get it out in a minute, you become what you behold. And the enemy knows that, and so he tries to put all these other things in our life to distract us. And let's talk real quick. I've got about a four-hour message I'm going to put in about 40 minutes, Okay. And, and that is no exaggeration. So if I look at my notes, it probably will be bad because I'll get anyway. So I'm going to just try to give you the highlights, okay? Let's talk about sin real quick. Sin is, is different in an unbeliever than it is in a believer. Sin is still sin. Sin is anything that you do that God says not to do. It is anything contrary to the will of God for your life. 
Uh, it could be, I mean, it could be a thousand different things, you know, and you know those things, most of you. If you don't, come talk to me. Uh, if, well, let me just put it this way. If you're wondering if it's sin, yes, it probably is. If you're asking yourself, I wonder if this is wrong or not, probably so. That's why you have that check in your spirit. But sin for an unbeliever is, it has a different effect than sin in a believer's life. And I've, I've, I've had people get upset at me about this because I don't think they heard my heart. So I'm, I'm going to try to take a little bit of time to explain this to you. An unbeliever is going, they're, they're on a path to destruction. They're on a path to hell. And it is not because they are sinning. Unbelievers are on their way to hell. And it is not because they have sin in their life. It is because the default mechanism of mankind is the path to hell. In other words, if a sinner just quits sinning, he is still on his way to hell. Are you with me? You could want people to just quit sinning, but that does not change their direction. There's some really good people that will find themselves in hell because... And here it is. They don't have a savior. Okay? What changes a person is it, what what sends someone to hell is not sin. It is the lack of a savior. Are you with me? If you jump off the if you jump off the cruise ship and you can't swim, you drowned not because there's water. You drowned because you don't have somebody to pull you out of the water. Okay? You can't blame the water. If there was just no water there, I wouldn't have drowned. No, if there was no water there, there wouldn't be a boat there in the first place. So you can't blame the water, right? You have to realize the reason people go to hell is not because of their sin. And the reason I'm making this point is because a lot of good-meaning, well-seasoned you know, well -seasoned church members get so mad when a sinner sins. You shouldn't freak out. I remember the first time in our church a few years ago, somebody was giving me a prayer request, and I got like three F-bombs right in the middle of it. I'm like, whoo, that was tough, you know? I mean, my eyes are getting blue. It's the first time I heard anybody, you know, hey, could you pray, pray for this? Because bleep, 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 you know? Well, they didn't understand, you know, that they, were, they weren't really even living for God, but they had a prayer request. And so we can't get shocked when an alcoholic drinks. Don't get upset at your neighbor if he doesn't live for God, if he's doing bad stuff, okay? Because if you go over there and tell him, you just need to turn that down, you need to you know, throw that marijuana away, and you start working on the fruit and not the root, he will never change, and he will think you're crazy, and you're never going to reach him for God. But when you realize that sinners sin, that's what they do, and when you realize that, you then you know the only way they stop is when they have a savior so you take jesus to the neighbor right you take jesus to them you present to them a life ring and then they can get out of the mess is everybody with me okay so but now sin in the life of a believer is a different situation because believers oftentimes will continue in the sin that they were set free from that is a tragedy I think it was the Apostle Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? And he answers his own question. He says, God forbid. How shall we who were dead to sin live any longer there in it? How shall, what, it's, it's baffling to him. Why would we who have been rescued throw the, throw the ring off and jump back in the ocean? Why would we do that? That's what he's asking us. And so sin in a believer's life has a different effect. Sin in a believer's life will take you out of God's plan for your life. The unbeliever is already out of God's plan, so sin has no effect on him when it comes to God's plan. But in a believer's life, sin will take you out of God's plan. Remember David and Bathsheba, right? I mean, we could go through the Old Testament and the New Testament. When we find sin, what it does is in the believer's life, it distracts them, it takes them away from God. Adam and Eve, what did sin do? It separated them from God. 
God came and walked with them and talked with them in the evenings and they had a conversation and they were face to face with God. Sin came in and what did sin do? Because they're believers, sin took them out of the Garden of Eden. It separated them. The, the Bible, it, it says, uh, Eve says, we won't, or the devil says, you won't surely die. But what, it, what, it, what the death really meant there was you won't, it, the truth of the matter was you would be separated from God. You wouldn't have a physical death, but you would be separated from God. Now, we're talking today about holiness. Holiness is a holy God that is separate from you. You, you. you know this to be true. You may not like it, but you can't just twist God's arm. You can't manipulate him. He's not going to, you know, be your genie in a bottle because he's God. He's separate. But when you decide, I am done with sin. When you decide. These things, that, as one of, the, one of the New Testament writers says, the sins that so easily beset me, when you decide to walk away from those things, it opens you up to see God in a new way. And so what I want us to do in this beginning of this year is to make our mind up to clean sin out of our life. So we're going to take an easy little step right now. I want everybody to pull your phone out. I want you to log in. I want you to go to your hidden pictures and pass your phone to the person next to you. And we had heart attacks. I want you to take your phone and I want you to pull out those emails that you sent to somebody with all the cursing and all that stuff. And I want you to pass that up here. Let me read it out loud. Right? I want you to go to your go to your web browser history, the one that you delete every day, and not delete it for a day or two and let me see it or let your wife see it or let your neighbor see it. Or your husband. Yeah. Uh-oh. Well, Pastor Gary is preaching now. See, it's those, it's those hidden things that we think nobody knows. And if they don't know, then it's okay. It's those hidden things. What they do is they rob us from truly seeing God. Because we become more like the world. Let me, let me get started with some scriptures here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Man, simple verse. It says, Be ye holy. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He said, he said, he's tapping Gary on the shoulder. Hey, Gary, be holy because God is holy. He's telling you, be holy because God is holy. What is holiness? Holy is being separate. Be separate because God is separate. Don't be like the world. Uh, we asked this a few weeks ago. Um, what in your life, you know, I, I, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. Don't, I'm, I'm not slamming you. But just answer the question to yourself. Don't answer it out loud. What in your life is different since you became a Christian? What old passed away? The Bible says old things will pass away because all things will become new. What is new in your life since you become a Christian? Has anybody noticed? Now the next question is, if, they, if there has been old things new, is it possible that there are still things though that you have just learned how to hide better? Isn't it true that we can come to church and we can say the right lingo, we can talk about, you know, doing life together, we can talk about seasons, we can say all these little correct little things, and we can raise our hands during worship, and, and the truth of the matter is we have a very defiled inside because we have learned how to hide things and not become separate like God called us to be. Come on, somebody. We can talk about grace and mercy and we can talk about there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus and we can go on and on and we can quote scriptures and sometimes people can even speak in tongues but that doesn't mean you have set yourself apart. It doesn't mean that you have a holy life. I know, this is good preaching. You just don't want to say so. Don't mistake. You need to write this down. You need to write it really big in the, in the front leaf of your Bible. You need to put it on your notepad. You need to put it on your refrigerator. Don't mistake God's grace for God's approval. Don't mistake God's grace for God's approval. Just because you still have the gifting of God, just because you can still prophesy, just because you can still come to church and feel a tingle down your spine, just because you can get in God's glory and you're like, whoo, it felt so good, I cried during worship. Just because you're experiencing the grace of God does not mean God approves of your behavior. It doesn't mean you've been set apart. 
You walk in this room on sometimes on a Sunday morning, man, Pastor Gray, I thought he was going to have a fun time. He started off so happy and fun. Now you feel like you're just coming at me, man. You're just throwing daggers at me. Just because you come in this door and you feel the anointing of God doesn't mean you developed it, doesn't mean you birthed it, and doesn't mean it has anything to do with you. Just because it spills over on you doesn't mean God is approving and that you have a holy life. Hallelujah. Here's, here's why I'm being hard today. God has got a plan and a purpose for this church. And we've got to make our minds up to follow that plan. That means we've got to be a little different. Not just weird. We've got to be set apart. We've got to be holy. Peter said it. Be holy because God is holy. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Man, I found this this week, and oh my goodness, it's just... It's like, it's one of those principles that's in the Bible, and, and your spirit knows it's there, but maybe you don't know where it's at, and, and so I just stumbled across this, just not, not searching for this at all, but it really gave me some, just some real direction for my life, and I hope it helps you. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. This is a tragic story of priests in the temple that God struck dead, but we're getting to verse 3 where there's the reason why. And I think it'll really help you. Look at Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Now, Aaron's sons, Nadar and Abihu, Abai, anyway, uh, N and A, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and author, look at this word, unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to God's command. So they were in church, doing church, but it wasn't the church that God called them to do. Everything that we just read is something they're supposed to do. But the timing of when they did it or how they did it, there was something when they did it that wasn't right. So that means you can go to church, you can look like the church, you can be a part of the church, but God is not happy with your churchness. Your churchiness, your, your religiousness is not impressing the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So look what happens. So uh, before the Lord, the contrary to his command, so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died in the presence of the Lord. Mm. Well, I just saw something right there. So many times we want, we're searching for the presence of God as if that is a mark of his approval. If I can just get in the presence of God, I'll be all right. If, if I had a different title for this story, it would be quit seeking the glory of God and start seeking the God of the glory. Quit seeking the glory of God. Quit seeking the presence of God and start seeking the God of the presence. So they're in the presence of God. They're in the temple. God's presence has filled the temple, but his presence brought death to them instead of life because they hadn't set themselves apart. Now, I'm so thankful for the cross. I'm so thankful that in my lifetime, I've never seen lightning come out of heaven and strike somebody down in the middle of service, even though there's a few people I could point out and help God with his aim. Amen? Yeah. It's like if, you go, if lightning's going to come, you know, <laughs> I can point you in the right direction, right? But God doesn't let me do that because if I'm pointing at them, it's because I don't see the sin in me. Because I got a big giant log sticking out of my eye, and I'm picking on somebody else because they got a little splinter in their eye, right? And so in the presence of God, God brings death to these people. Now look what it says after that. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is Aaron's sons. He goes to Moses. Man, what in the world's going on? My guys are doing their thing, and God struck them dead. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, Listen to these words. To those who come near me, I will show my holiness. And in the sight of all people, I will reveal my glory. Man, that is a nugget right there. Let me break that down for you. He says, he says to those who come near me, I will show them my holiness. I will show them a part of me that is set apart. I will show them something that is reserved for only them. And to the rest of the congregation, to the other people, it says, and in the sight of all the other people, I will reveal my glory. 
And so there's two things going on. If you want to see the holiness of God, you've got to separate yourself so you have to become holy so you can see the holy thing. Otherwise, what happens is you need to stand outside on the street and watch the presence of God move. Don't get into the presence of God looking for his holiness because if you find it and you're not holy, it will not bring life to you. In their case, it brought death. Now, once again, we're on this side of the cross. And I say this with a lot of reservation. God is not in the striking people dead business anymore. But in the New Testament, it still happened. In the book of Acts, it still happened. In the book of Acts, a husband came in and he talks about this land that they sold. And he lies in the presence of God. He's talking about something that he set apart, something that they reserved for God, but he's lying to God. And something came out of heaven and killed him right there. And a few minutes later, it might have been his wife came in first, I can't remember. One of them, a few minutes later, the other spouse walks in telling the same lie. And the disciples said, the same guys that just carried your husband out is coming to get you. And boom, they fell dead. Now, I wish I could move that story and say, well, that's just in the Old Testament and God's a God of grace and love and all that kind of stuff. But I can't move that because I didn't write it. I didn't put it there. The truth of the matter is, we have got to go to God in such a way. Well, you don't have to. But if you want to see the good stuff, you've got to separate yourself. You've got to go to God in holiness. Well, Gary, I'm not holy. No, you're not. But God is. And when you separate yourself, you become holy like him. So there's that story. Let me, let me, let me, so, so let, me, you know, let me just kind of give you how Gary's brain works. Uh, so I read that, and then all of a sudden I started just getting all these stories of the difference between the crowd and the close one. The difference between the ones that, that just see the glory of God, and, and when I say the glory of God, glory, the glory of God is, it's, it's like uh, if you went to a concert, and you're in the concert, and they got the haze and the lights, and you're out there in the concert, and everything's, yeah, you know, boop, 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 you know, it's just going crazy. You're in the glory of the concert, but there's people that are backstage that you can't even see. They're in the presence of the singer. You see what I'm saying? They have been set apart. And, and, and so there's story after story in the Bible, and I'm going to share quick, quickly three or four of those with you. There's stories in the Bible, and, and man, all of a sudden I begin to see, oh, God, you're calling me. You're calling me to be more holy. You're calling me closer. You're calling me to the inner circle. I can't be, I can't be content with being on the outside. I want to get on the inside. God, how do I get on the inside? And he told me, you just got to start being holy. Yeah, you got to start clearing out your stuff. You got you to be holy before me. So listen, here's a few of these. David shows up at the battle, okay? David shows up at the battle expecting to see the glory of the battle. He gets there. This is the, the story of David and Goliath. He gets there. You know, everybody's got their, their stuff on. They got their swords. They got their shields. They're all polished up. They're ready to go. And then Goliath comes out. He begins to holler and scream. And all of his brothers and the whole army goes and hides. And David's just standing like, what in the world's going on? And he, he's, he's baffled by this. And so, you know, they have some conversations. Eventually, David goes down the mountainside, and he goes and he kills the giant, okay? Now, the army saw the glory of the battle. Are you with me? David had the head of his enemy. Sometimes we're, 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 we're looking for the glory. We want God to go do it, but he's calling us to set ourselves apart so we can walk down that mountain and take the head of our enemy. We can't do that if we're not holy. David says before he kills him, he, he says to Goliath, he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. But before he says that, he, to Saul, he says, he says, I've killed a lion, I've killed a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will fall as well. And there's things in our life that we have to kill. There's lions and bears in our life that we have to kill. And there's a whole story on that. And it, it, I'm writing a book eventually. I'll get it done one of these days. Anyway, you can read that later. So, another story, okay? The children of Israel saw the glory of God. When, 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 when Moses would go and pray, he, they had the tabernacle in the Old Testament. They had this tent. It was set up to, for, for God's presence. And God's presence would come in the tent. And Moses would go and he would pray and he would go into the, the most holy place. He would go in there and pray. Matter of fact, that's where Aaron's sons died. But he would go into the most holy place and he would pray. Where were the people at? The Bible says that they stood at the tent, the door of their tent. 
And they would see the glory of God. That's what it says. And it, what, what it's talking about, they would see the pillar of fire come down out of heaven. And they would see the glory cloud that would come out of heaven. And they would see the glory of God. And, and they might be like us on a good Sunday. They was like, oh, I feel God's presence. I, feel, I got tingles on my spine. I must be doing everything right. But if you ask them, you want to go into the holy place? They're like, oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> right? It's the same thing when they left Egypt. They left Egypt. And the whole reason they left Egypt, the whole reason the children of Israel, the slaves, left Egypt was not necessarily to go to the promised land. It was to go worship God. It's over and over. He says to Pharaoh, let my people go that we can go three days journey into the desert and worship him. Well, guess what? They get out. They go three days in the journey in the desert. They get to the mountain. The mountain of God is there. And the glory of God comes down on the mountain. And it's got fire and volcanoes and black smoke and all this stuff's going and Moses is like I am going to the mountain who's going with me and they're like no we're good that's exactly what happened they're like no and then and then God put a barrier up and said you're right you can't come because you're not holy because you haven't set yourself apart you want to blend in with the world. You want to talk like the world. You want to smell like the world. You want to sing like the world. You want to do all these things the world does, and you don't want to be set apart, so you got to stay down there. Moses goes up the mountain, and when he gets in the mountain, he's so crazy. He says, God, I want to see your face. See, there's a, <laughs> there's a separate place of God that Moses wanted to get to. He wasn't content at the base of the mountain. David wasn't content at the top of the hill. He had to go down and kill the giant. The children of Israel, they found their contentment just being in the presence of God. But they were afraid to go into the holy place with God. Another one, Joel in the Old Testament, the prophet Joel, he prophesies. And he says, he says uh, it's, it, I think it's Joel chapter 2. He says, in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And it goes on about dreaming dreams and having visions. And Joel, he is on, he's on the pre-side of a prophetic word. And he's speaking this prophetic word. And when he's speaking it, he's focused on what's coming out. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And, and your young men will dream dreams. And your old man, I hope I get this right, your old men will, will see visions. That might be may, may backwards. But anyway, don't kill me later. Uh, Read it. It's Joel chapter 2. And so, they, uh, and so he's focused on what's coming out. He's given this description of what's coming out. Fast forward, Peter's in the, the book of Acts, and, and the Holy Ghost has fallen. You know, like a rushing mighty wind, it came and it filled the house, and they all begin to speak in tongues and, and these utterances, and, and the power of God is moving, and, and it all spills out on the street, and it, man, it's just, you know, 5,000 people are about to get saved. It's this incredible thing, and they ask Peter, what in the heck's going on? And Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days, and then he adds a word. He says, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. You see, what he's saying is, because now he's not looking at what happened, he's received what happened now his focus is not on the outpouring it's on who poured it out he's decided i i, I see this and i i'm happy with this but i want to know where it came from and so his focus is my heart is not just to get all wrapped up in who's speaking in tongues and yabba dabba do and what does that sound like and you know my hyundai hyundai and all that kind of stuff he's not even talking about that he's like oh my goodness what that did is it birthed in me a desire to be set apart and i don't want to just see who's speaking in tongues i want to see where in the world it came from who is the god that just radically changed my life i'm not happy just coming to church and patty caking for jesus i want to see the jesus Jesus that I'm patty caking for. I want to see the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I'm willing to be set apart to do that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 6. Man, what a powerful thing. What a powerful verse. Verses. I think, I think we're going to read like 1 through 6. It starts off, Isaiah chapter 6. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. This is Isaiah. He's, he's about to get his calling. He's about to come, become Isaiah. He's about to become the prophet of the nations and, and even of our nation today. He's about to just be radically changed. And he says, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I love this word, it's also, everybody say also. He said, I also saw the Lord. In other words, King Uzziah was a loved king. He was the great leader. He was, he was the king of Judah and everybody loved him. And when, when he died, it was a tragic thing. But he didn't just see that. He said, I also saw the Lord sitting on a throne, 
high and lifted up. Let me read this to you. And he says, he's high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Everybody say, the train filled the temple. So picture this in your mind, okay? He's having this vision. He sees the Lord. He's, the Lord is high and lifted up on a throne. But the train, his garment, filled the temple. A lot of church people want to hang out in the garment zone. They want to hang out down here in the glory. This is the glory of God. And there is nothing wrong with the glory of God. It's in the glory of God that, that we sing. And it, we're in the glory of God that we feel his presence. But that's not, what I, that's not what Isaiah's focused on. And it can't be what we focus on. And I'm going to give you why in a minute. It can't be the thing. If I can just get to church and feel the glory of God, I'll be all right all week. Well, that might be true. But what if you don't make it next week? If you're just living on the glory anointing, you're missing the point. If you're just happy hanging out in the clothing of God, you're missing the point. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And then he begins to describe, he talks about these seraphims. He said, and above it stood the seraphims. He's saying above it. Above what? Above the throne. He's not looking down here anymore. Man, we're, we get so caught up in, in, in the presence of God. And, and don't, don't misunderstand me. Don't fire me. I love, we have to have the presence of God. We have to have it. It's a result of God. When he comes in the room, his presence comes with him. But if we just focus on the presence of God, we miss the God of the presence. And we have to put our focus on not what he's wearing, but who he is. Come on, somebody. Because when you realize who he is, that changes you. You can't fit in his clothes. You're not going to ever get to wear his garment. But guess what? When you find out who he is, it changes who you are. All of a sudden, I can become holy because he is holy. The Bible never says that I can become his presence. But it does say I can become holy once. Why? Because he is holy. Hallelujah. I'm preaching much better than y'all letting on. <laughs> Hallelujah. So here it is that the seraph, he, he, he lifts his, he, he, you know, maybe it's, I don't know what the robe looks like. Maybe it's this purple with sequins and sparkly and, you know, maybe it's got, you know, LED lights in it. Maybe it's, you know, got glitter going, little puffs of glitter and a fog machine. And maybe it's got all this stuff that we would think is just so cool. But he's not looking at that. His eyes are still up. He knows the glory has filled the temple, but his eyes are still up on the king. And as he's trying to look to the king, he says, above it, above the throne stood the seraphims, each one having six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, I love this, he did fly. And cried one to another. Listen what these angels are saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The angels are not like, check out this purple garment. That's pretty cool. No, they're saying holy, holy is the Lord. What does holy mean? Separated, individual, one of a kind, nothing like it. They're saying, he, I've never seen anything. These angels have been, you read Revelation, they have been saying that since the beginning of time. And they will continue to say that until time is no more. And we step into an eternity. And they will continue to say that until eternity ends, which never ends. And they say it over and over and over again holy holy and it's not because they're just like on a repeat cycle it's not you know the, the old record player is just stuck in a crazy track it is because every time they look at him they see something they've never seen before they see a new side of God they see a new part of God they see a new facet of God we come to church and we think well I just show up when I can and leave when I want to because that's just what you do on Sunday as if God is just our buddy and I've heard people People pray and say, hey, bud, how you doing? Let me tell you something. He ain't your buddy. He's not just some guy wearing a fuzzy beard. He's not just some dude with a staff in his hand that's got some nice sandals. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is no God. There is no God like him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth. Now, let's look at this. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is where you have to decide. Do I want to see the holiness of God or do I want to operate in the glory of God? Now, there's nothing wrong with the glory of God, but if you're just in the glory of God and you don't know the holiness of God, you're not going to be very effective. 
Because glory comes and goes. The glory cloud is a cloud. You can't grab a hold of it. You can't manufacture it. You can't bottle it. You can't, I mean, how cool would it be if we could bottle fresh air and just keep it, you know, for when you're around somebody that doesn't smell so good or something. You know, it just doesn't work that way, does it? How cool would it be if you could just bottle the Holy Ghost and, and just stick it in a bottle? It doesn't work that way. But when you get a hold of the God of the Holy Ghost, when you get a hold of the God of the blessing, when you get a hold of the God of the, of the healing, and you put him right here, guess what? Then you become the person that can emit the glory of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So the, the holy, 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 they sing, the Lord God of, 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 of the, the whole earth is full of his glory. And then it says, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, listen to Isaiah, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. I, I mean, it's, it's like the new phrase people say, I was just so undone. I mean, I know what you mean. You know, you felt God. But did it radically change you? I mean, if you're, to me, if you're undone, it means you changed. You know? I, I don't mean to sound mean, but I'm just tired of these little Christian cute little sayings we say. And we're not any different than we were before. I mean, really. We're different when we get in the presence of God. But outside of the presence of God, we revert back to who we were. Anybody. Anybody can smile on Sunday morning. What about Tuesday? What about Friday at 6 o'clock when they forgot to print your paycheck? <laughs> the whole earth is full. The doors moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes, look at these words, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me. See, these seraphims are flying around. They're declaring God is holy, he's holy, he's holy. But when, when Isaiah realized he needed to be holy too, it changed what was going on. The seraphim went to the fire of God and picked up with a tong, a coal, and the Bible says it placed it on his lips, and he became clean. Let me read it to you. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Hallelujah. What happened, Gary? What are you, what are you trying to tell me? It could be that there's a whole bunch of other church people hanging out in the garment section and they didn't have any change in their life. But because Isaiah looked up and saw the Lord and it changed his perspective of him. When it changed his perspective of him, all of a sudden he realizes, oh, I've got to be like him. I've got to be like him. And I wish I had another hour. Can you hang on for a few minutes? Genesis chapter 32. I'll just paraphrase this story. Genesis 32. It's 24 through 28. It's the story of Jacob. Jacob has been a cheater, a thief his entire life. He had to leave home because he stole his brother's birthright. He's lived in another country. He's suffered there. He's also been blessed there. He finally decides, I got to get back home. And so he's heading back home, and Jacob has got hundreds of animals, hundreds of blessings. And boy, we get so, we get so messed up. We sometimes think, we sometimes think that, uh, that, well, God's still blessing me, so I must be doing all right. That's not true. Just because God's blessing you doesn't mean you're doing all right. Jacob is off in another country and he's receiving the blessing of God because God said it was, he was going to bless him. But Jacob's life is a wreck. He is a thief. He is stolen. Jacob dressed up as his brother to deceive his father to get the birthright. 
it's kind of weird, but it says that, that Jacob put on goat skin. He, he skinned a goat and put goat skin on himself so when his blind father touched him, he knew it was Esau. It just makes me wonder, how much hair did Esau have? My gosh. Oh, yeah, it was like a goat. must be Esau. <laughs> I mean, the depth of the deception that Jacob pulled over on his, on his own father, his flesh and blood, is mind-boggling. He leaves, and while he's gone, God still blesses him. He comes back, and on his way back, he realized, man, I got to get back to my brother. You know, that guilt is eating him up. That shame. I've lived in the presence of God my whole life, but I'm still a mess. And so he's making his way back, and he gets to the, to the brook, and he decides, all right, we got, we got to make some changes because on the other side of this brook is going to be where my brother's land is. And so they begin to divide the sheep and the goats, and they take a few hundred goats, and they, he tells the shepherd, I want you to take these goats, and I want you to head toward Esau. And when you see Esau, I want you to say to him, your, your servant Jacob is coming, and he's sending these as a tribute to you. And so there goes a hundred sheep, and there goes a hundred goats, and here goes a hundred camels, and it's, it's hundreds of animals, and it's this procession one after another. And Jacob has realized if he's going to change, he's got to, he's, got, he's got to change. And so he begins to set things apart. He, be, he's try, he doesn't know it, but he's becoming holy. He's saying, you know what? I, if I keep these sheep, it's not going to help me if I'm dead. Then he looks at his family. He's got, he's got two wives and kids everywhere. And, you know, I mean, it's just a huge, you know, servants and all this stuff. And so he decides, I'm going to send half of them this way, and I'm going to send half of them that way. Just in case Esau starts killing people, he won't kill them all. And so he lets this part of his family go, and he lets this part of his family go. And that's what, God, that's what Jesus says, unless you leave your father and your mother, your brother and your sister, and follow me, you have no part of my kingdom. See, that's becoming holy. You're setting yourself apart. Don't leave your wife and blame it on me. I didn't say that. And so he separates all these things. And then it gets to where in, in, this, in this verse, Genesis chapter 32, verse 24, he's completely alone. He has nothing else. He's standing at a brook, and the brook is called Jabbok, and Jabbok actually means empty. So he's standing at the empty brook, and God has given him the wisdom that he must become empty. Because if he becomes empty, he becomes set apart. And so through the process of sending all this away and saying, you know what, I don't need that, I don't need this, and I don't need that, I don't need this anymore. We find Genesis chapter 32, verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Have you ever stood before God completely alone? Without any idol, without any sin, without any preconceived notion and idea of who God is. Because we're human in our human condition, it's almost impossible to stand before God completely alone. But here we have Jacob. I, 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 they're terrible words, but I love the words because it spoke so much to my heart. Gary, when was the last time you stood before me without a gifting, without a talent, without a calling? without money in your pocket, without a place to live, when was the last time you stood before me completely alone? Man, I live in America. We hate to be alone. That's why we have Facebook. We rate, we rate our social status by how many friends we have. Jacob stands completely alone. And when we dare to separate ourselves from all the stuff, we become, here it is, holy. Because holiness means separated. When you dare to stand before God and say, God, it's you and me. I don't care if you ever put a tingle down my spine. I don't care if Josh sings my favorite song. I don't care if, if they got, you know, cushions chairs at, at, at church I don't care if I ever go to church I just need you look what happens and a man wrestled with Jacob until the breaking of the day something happened he saw a part of God 
that no one had ever seen. He saw the holiness of God because he became holy. There was a separate part of God that we had never seen until this point in the Bible. We're in Genesis. I know it's the beginning of the Bible, but we've never seen this thing happen before. It's not, a, It's not. you know, some people say it's the angel of the Lord. It doesn't say that. It just says a man. If you look it up, it actually says an unknown man, a separate man, a specific separate man. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. When Jacob set himself apart, he saw a part of God that he had never seen. And when we decide to set ourselves apart from all of our fears, all of our anxieties, all of our ideas, all of our notions, all of our, our thoughts and all these things and all the sin in our life, when we decide to set ourselves apart, we become holy and then we're not just getting caught up in, in the glory of God, but we get to operate in the presence or in the holiness of God. So they wrestled all night. And this 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 man thing this he, he touched him and he and he he touched his hip and Jacob's hip hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him then he said he's then the, the this angel thing said let me go for the day has broken but Jacob said I will not let you go unless you bless me and then this angel thing said what is your name and he said my name is Jacob and he said well your name is going to no longer be called Jacob it's going to be called Israel. I looked up that word Israel. There's a, there's a lot of people that say Israel means the prince of God or God's prince man. But there's, a, there's, an unknown, there's an unknown verb. It's not used anywhere else except in the name Israel. And if you search that little unknown verb, and I'm, I'm not a linguist by any means, but if you search that, that unknown word, that unknown, uh, unused verb, the closest representation we have in English is the word turgor. T-U-R-G-O-R. Has anybody ever heard the word turgor before? Wow. We got one. I had never heard it either. We got two. Three. Turgor. You, the way I can best describe turgor, if you don't water a plant, you see the opposite of turgor. Turgor talks about the pressure of the water inside of a plant. And so the turgor pressure causes the plant to stand up. So without the pressure of turgor, when you quit watering a plant, it runs out of water. And what happens? The plant begins to wilt and fade. And this is a picture of the church today. We get in the glory of God and we get all puffed up. And then we get to Tuesday evening and we've lost the water. We, we, we get back to Sunday and we're good. And then by Thursday evening, maybe Monday morning, we lose our turgor. Jacob's name goes from being, you are Jacob, the one that, that, that trips people in the hill, to being you are Israel, the one that can stand up through anything. The one that can stand up through anything. Because in Psalms it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And then it says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf, I love this part, his leaf also shall not, anybody know? Wither. In other words, he will have turgor. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? You got to back up. Because he's planted by the rivers of living water. He's not just seeking the glory of God. He's seeking the God of the glory. Because when you put the God of the glory inside of you, you become like that little lady at the well. Jesus says, you know what? Get me a drink. And she says, you ain't got no bucket. And they have a whole conversation about water bottles and all this kind of stuff. And then Jesus says, if you drink of this water, you got to come back and you got to get a drink again. And if you just drink from the glory of God, you got to keep coming back and drinking again. But when you get into the holiness of God, guess what? Then all of a sudden Jesus says, I will put a river of living water in you. It will spring up inside of your soul and, and you will never go thirsty. It will be a spring of living water in 
the desert. It'll be a river in the desert when there's no water, what's an impossible. And when you get to Monday morning and they say you're fired, you're like, you know what? That's okay. I don't care about my job. I care about the God of the job. And when the doctor says you're going to die because you got cancer, you're like, you know what? I don't like that verdict, but the truth of the matter is, I know my God, and my God can heal me, and He's inside of me. I'm not caught up in the tingles on my spine. I'm caught up in the glory of God and who He is and the God of the glory. Stand up with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jacob never walked the same. He never walked the same. The Bible says his hip was out of, it was out of joint. His hip was out of joint. Never got back in place right. He was different. What's different about you? Do you have a limp? Is there there something in you that makes you different? If it's not God, you're really not different. You know, you don't have... I I ain't got time to talk about fashion, but anyway. Bow your head with me. I could go for another hour. Praise God. Lord, reveal to us. Give us that better than 2020 vision. God, give us revelation. Show us. Man, I know as I'm speaking, I know God is showing you some things in your life that it is time to walk away from. It is time to separate from. Lord, I pray that you give us boldness, confidence to step away from those sins that so easily beset us. Lord, we want to turn to you, the holy God of Israel, the holy God, the holy God that doesn't wilt, the holy God that, that doesn't fall, the holy God of Turgor that doesn't, that doesn't lose its ability to hold on to its strength. That name Israel actually means with that, when you, when you put in that unknown verb, it actually means a receptacle in which God can be received and retained. A receptacle in which God can be received and retained we got a lot of church people that can receive God but we need to have a bunch of church people in 2020 that can retain God and the only way that happens is when we decide to turn our back on everything that gets in our way so here's the question what do you need to turn away from what's in your life that you need to turn away from what is it could be unforgiveness could be jealousy could be gossiping Could be some other some other form of sin. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I want if you if you're willing to walk away from your stuff and step into the holiness of God. When I get to three, I want you to get out of your seat and make a move to the front. Lord, in your mighty name, Lord, we declare today that we are your children. Lord, let us act like that. Lord, let us be separate. From the world come out from among them your word says and be ye separate lord not to be weird not to be strange but to be to have permission to go into the holy place with you lord let us be separate Lord, we consecrate our life today. We declare today. Lord, I just pray for confidence in this room. I pray for strength in this room that we are going to walk away from the mess in our life in Jesus' name. It could just be fear. You're just eating up with fear. You've accepted anxiety as your as your pal. You've just made it part of your life. Maybe it's an addiction. Whatever it is, God is here today, and he's, he's revealing it to your heart. It's not just by chance that you have something that you know I'm talking about. It's not just by chance that God has brought that to your heart. He's brought it to your heart because he's going to set you free. If that's you, when we get to three, get out of your seat. Are you ready? One, and God loves you. He's on your side. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. Two, you can do this. And three, come on, make your way to the front. Hallelujah. 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 Maybe it's a person he showed you you need to go to. Maybe it's some area in your life that's weak. Lord, I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for setting us free. I thank you, God, that we're not content. God, stand on the mountain. We want to go down the valley, and we want to destroy the works of the enemy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.